and welcome to another Sunday Talk within the Nine Sided Circle. I'm one of your two hosts, Nora Kyle. And I am the other one of your two hosts, Mushtaq Ali. So we want to thank you for joining us once again, or for the very first time, to our public talk that we like to do every week. And uh, yeah, I guess this is spiel time. I just like rolled right into it. <laughs> yeah, you did. So carry on. Uh, um, yeah, so here we are. You may be here with us live or you may be watching on the replay. In any case, we are happy to have you. And one way that you can help us out as a contributor is either to join us live if you like, and you can find us on Facebook through the Nine Sided Circle page, and you can join the forum. And from there, you can get access to our live talks through the Zoom links that we post there. And if that's not for you, then you can always comment here and be part of the conversation here. And it would be a great benefit to us if you were up for doing that whole like, comment, subscribe thing. The subscribe part is especially important to us right now because we are still working towards a thousand subscribers. We are hoping to get to join the YouTube Partner Program so that we can take charge of the commercials that are put before and during our talks and hopefully get rid of them all together. We are so close to reaching that number. And if As of today, we are yeah. 959 subscribers. Ah, every day. It's just a little bit closer. Yeah. And we could really use your help in getting all the way to a thousand. So if you have already done so, we thank you. If you haven't done it yet, we thank you in advance for t making the choice to do that. Other than that, do you have any announcements to make? Uh, yes, we are um, reminding everybody that if you happen to have any spare change uh, that you can donate to the Nine Sided Circle, this is a great time to do it. We are uh, having to deal with medical issues. Uh, the medical issues are mostly dealt with, but the uh, financial blowback from the medical issues are um, hanging, looming over us. So uh, if you have a little spare change that does not take food out of your mouth or anything like that, and you can pass it on to uh, the nine-sided circle for its upkeep, we would be ever so grateful because we are not going to have as much money out of our own pockets this week to keep this thing going. Yeah, there's a little bit of catch up to do right now, and we appreciate any help that you are able to for us. Thank you so, very much. If you like us, donate a little money. If you hate us, donate money because it'll distract us and we might go away and never do this again. You don't know. Could happen. Oh, uh, yeah. So. There's that. Anything else that we need to share? Uh, you are in almost perfect health now. I am. For those who are concerned, I am yes. almost done with my antibiotics and feeling pretty good. So, yay! Yes, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. And hopefully, you know, when tomorrow rolls around, when I'm all set with my antibiotics, this will be a chapter that we can close the book on. <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to that. <laughs> Me too. All right. Every day when you wake up and you ain't dead is a good day. I 100% agree. Yes. <sighs> so. So. Let's get started. And I think that you should get us started. You should get us started. So, we say that the, the work has been hiding itself in plain sight since pretty much the beginning of history. And we're going to spend a, a little time talking about that. Next week, we're going to talk about one of the oldest Enlightenment stories ever made. Uh, which is the descent of Inanna into the underworld. But this week, we are going to be talking about 
the Gospel according to John, which is the fourth gospel in the Christian New Testament and the non-synoptic gospel. Um, and it has some stuff hidden in it that is right there, but you won't see unless you know how to look. So this evening, we're going to take a look and see what we can learn, if that sounds good. So there, there is some controversy about uh, the Gospel of John. One of, one of the controversies is um, scholars, many scholars are pretty sure that Mary Magdalene had a much bigger role in the original Gospel. But if you look at uh, the existent papyri, you see that she's basically been scratched out and written over, which is kind of fascinating. There are some heretical people who say that Mary Magdalene actually wrote the Gospel according to John. Uh, we'll never be able to, approve it, to prove any of that. I kind of like to think that that might be the case. Because it was written by uh, the disciple who Jesus loved. And we all know who that is. But be that as it may. So, we're going to take a look at the first five lines of the Gospel, which makes a preamble. And uh, we're going to uh, look at the actual Greek, and we're going to use uh, a text called Papyrus 66, which is the very oldest copy of the Gospel of John that we have. And... Uh, we're going to pull it apart, word by word. So, hold on to your seats. And the Gospel says, in Arche Iologos, Kaiologos, in Proston Theon, Kai Theos in Logos. That's the first line. In Arche, the word Arche uh, is where we get words like archaic, archaeology, uh, things like that. It means the earliest, the most beginningest, uh, the origin, the thing that commences, uh, the first person or thing in a series. So what this says in Arche in Ologos, in the beginning, at first, the first in the line is the Logos. Now, what the heck is Logos, you might ask? It's a very interesting word, and it's usually translated as word. So, in, in any Christian, English Christian translation that you pick up, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the usual translation. This is not a great translation. So, if you look at the word logos, the first definition, and the one that is most used, is reason, as in the faculty of reason. Uh... And it can also mean speech. And most in interestingly, it means ratio. Now, ratio and reason are related words. Did you know that? Reason, rational, ratio. Uh, also, logic comes from, lit literally comes from the word logos. So, in the beginning, the very first thing is this rational faculty that has the connotation of ratio. You all understand what a ratio is? You should take some time to explain that. Chris, explain to us a ratio. 
the relationship between two things? Yes, and specifically uh, in math, what do we look at as a ratio? N numerator and denominator? Yes, and if we look at the old Greek math, uh, a ratio is always whole. So uh, you have the golden mean. So the golden mean is what, two by three? And that gives you a ratio, uh, two units over three units. Now, the, the weird thing is, is if you draw a diagonal, you never get a ratio. You never get a whole ratio. You get an irrational number always. The stock uh, already getting taboo. Yes, the square root of two, man. Them Pythagoreans will kill you for that one. So, uh, Ilmar, did you have a question already? Uh, no, I did not. Okay, I just saw you. Well, then, it. hi. Yeah, hi. hi. Glad <laughs> nice you're here. You. All good. All right, so irrational numbers onward. Yeah, so the idea of ratio uh, as being something important comes out of the Pythagoreans. And it is the, the idea of perfect balance. And Pythagoreans hated the irrational. They would burn you at the stake for, for trying to factor pi uh, or any of the other irrational numbers. It just it made them crazy. So one of the things that we can look at this and say is, hmm, maybe at least this first part of the gospel was written by somebody who was a student of Pythagoras. Because it sure sounds like it. But we won't say that because that's heretical and obviously cannot be true. So. With the origin, by the origin, uh, there is the faculty of reason. And then we get kaiologos. Um, Kai means and, also even, and but. So, Kaiho is but this, and this, uh, and that, and these. Logos again. The Logos exists, is present, uh, and is near towards and with regards to uh, this deity. And when you read this in the Greek, this... Uh, Ime pros hol theos, it means is not, but is next to. Uh, so that's why we get the, the, the with God, that it has this sense of it is uh, connected towards with, uh, but not the same as. And then it goes on to say, again, uh, kai, theos, and God, uh, imeho, again, that uh, to exist, uh, to happen, to be present, uh, the... Logos, 
um, is connected to the theos. So that's how we get the uh, is God out of the, the standard translation. So did that make any sense at all? First, there was the Logos. First, there was the rational faculty. And it was... Uh, you can say it was with, it was connected to but not Theos. Interestingly, uh, the, the way the Greeks use Theos here is any deity, male or female. There is no gender necessity to this. So, you could say, in the beginning, there was the Logos, and the Logos was beside the deity, and the Logos was within the deity. Does that make sense? Who's following me? Who's fallen asleep? And who is completely confused? And there's a dog somewhere, so Noor is completely galumphing off. No, I'm following Bucky. you. And I, yeah. I yeah. have things to say, but I just want to make sure I know which direction you're going with this before mm. I say anything. Oh, no, say, say whatever you want, because... I don't even know what direction I'm going with. I'm just translating the Greek for you so that you can find a hidden truth in it. All right. So this was my line of thinking. Sure. That there has to be something before reason. Yes! Right. Continue. You just got me excited. Right. So first... There has to be, from the creator, or God, a desire. From the desire must come, an intention is formed from a desire. And then, from the intention, the creator must conceive with reason what he wants to create, what they want to create. So there, then comes reason and ratio. That, that, so he wants to create the world. He has to conceive it in whatever God's head is. And he has to create it with a, with a divine ratio. Give the man a cigar. You have found one of the first secrets of this. So, who can tell me what the first five, first nine numbers of our numerical system are? Anybody? First nine numbers. Or first ten numbers. Actually, first ten numbers. Give me the first ten numbers of our numerical first system. Ten. First ten. Count them off. Chris, I feel like you're just like, you should just go for it. Go for it, Chris. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> yes, the first number is zero. In Archos, at the start, what happens before the start? The start is the Big Bang. The start is that moment where the divine presence says, be, kun. Ain't she sweet? Exclamation point. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Mimi, it's not you. <laughs> I don't know if you know that you're not muted, just letting you know. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I can mute you if you like. 
I can mute myself, can I? Okay. Or no? Yeah, you can. It's in the uh, bottom right. <laughs> All right. Just making sure. Okay. So, the Big Bang. The Big the Bang. Fayakun. Yes. Would be, and it is if we're talking about the Islamic context. But... Yeah, or even, you know. How do you and you'll notice that the first line of this text, the first two words, in Archos, in the beginning, echoes Genesis. Right? So there is this mirror between uh, the Torah and this gospel which is also found in Islam later, but we'll talk about that at a later point. Yeah, if you want to uh, talk about the, the B and it is, you're right, that also happens in Genesis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. let there be light, and there was. Mm -hmm. So, you would say here, though, let there be logic, and there was. So, you have pre-eternity, and existence. Whatever was going on before the Big Bang, we can't even know. But we assume that the Divine Presence was there. And when it said, okay, let's have a universe, its first emanation into that universe was Logos. Reason, ratio, logic, symmetry, all these wonderful things. Uh, another word for, uh, another meaning of the word logos is cause, by the way. And there is a, an Arabic equivalent, which is sabab, or sababu, um, which means almost exactly the same thing as logos. And, but we probably won't have too much time to get into that and how that relates. So, in the beginning, in Arche in Logos, in the beginning was the Logos. So in the beginning was all of these things. It was the first thing, the first emanation in the ray of creation was, was not love, was not uh, laws, it was reason. What do you think, what does that imply? wants to take a stab at that. By the way, just so you guys know, my Greek is terrible. I have terrible pronunciation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have not studied Greek for 40 years at least. And so I am limping along uh, pronouncing the various words. But I have the meanings pretty darn good. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, doing the, the homework that I was doing was, oh my God, I have no idea how to say these things. But that doesn't mean I can't understand. Yeah. So we just do our best. Um, so Aaron says, so that first principle, how can we understand that? Aaron offers unchaos. Um. Yes, in the sense of, um, in the, the free-form sense of chaos, not the mathematical sense of chaos, but in the sense of uh, randomness, almost, rather than chaos. Uh, 
And interestingly, when we get into some of the Sumerian uh, stories that relate to this, we talk about the Abzu, which is the, uh, the pit of chaos. So Nancy offers another spin on that, in that she asks, you should insist on things making sense? Um, no, because you may not have the capacity to see the sense of it. Mm -hmm. Rather, you should realize that uh, there, there is something beyond the random. There is an organizing principle at work here. And that organizing principle is in fact rational and logical. Well, and logic, was... logic means consistent. It means it, it follows certain rules uh, of consistency within thought. One of the ways the Greeks used this word was to mean order. Yeah. So, I had a comment. Yes. Yeah. If I have a, an intention, let's say my intention is to work on, let's say, the breathing exercise. The first thing I do is, I say in my head, I think the words, today I am going to work on a breathing exercise. So it's, it's necessary for me to have that internal dialogue. That's just on, this is a, on a low, a low level of just a, an individual human. I'm thinking, that God, the creator, will have something similar on a creator level, and that the, the dialogue of God will be um, using whatever words the creator would use. And the words will represent what is going to become the action later on. In my case, it will be actually doing the breathing exercise. Sitting down and trying to be aware of my breath. For the creator, it would be actually doing the work of creating the world based on the words that, that came first. Yes, or you could say bringing things from the uh, ideal into the actual. That's another way of saying it. Perhaps not the best way, but a good way. Yeah, I think that's a good doorway to understanding Jonathan. Yeah. You're on I a roll tonight, Jonathan. Yeah. Personally, I, I, it, I think we all understand that it doesn't necessarily mean literal internal dialogue, but just this sense of like potentiality coming into motion somehow. That spurring forth. Yeah. And the idea that first comes. First comes the word, first comes the statement, first comes the cause, first comes the ratio, first comes the uh, faculty of reason around something. Um, I remember a series of science fiction books, which, or they were fantasy books actually, and the hero in it move through different universes by creating syllogisms uh, that fit that universe and he would recite the syllogism and manifest uh, the it, 
the new world, as it were. And this is a little bit like that. You all know what a syllogism is, right? Yes, no, maybe? Uh, a a, a three-part statement consisting of two... Uh, what's the word I want? Two prepositions and a conclusion. So the, the classic syllogism... Uh, and this is out of uh, your basic deductive logic, Aristotelian sort of stuff, uh, is all men are mortal, one. And Socrates is a man, two. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. And if the first two are true and follow the rules of logic, then the out then the, the the outcome has to also be true. So premise one is that all men are mortal, right? Women, that's a different story. So can we test that all, all men are mortal? Yeah, we look around. So far, everybody uh, everybody seems to be dying off. There's a possibility that somebody somewhere is still living for a thousand years, but we tend to be terminal beings. Socrates is one of those terminal beings, therefore Socrates is mortal. Uh, these three things fit. So premise, premise, conclusion, everything fits together. That's a syllogism. They can be fancier than that, but this is the classic. And there's like 40 some odd syllogisms or 30 or something. I lose count after a while. Chris, so, so yeah, just the, the, the way that I've uh, understood logos is the principle of intelligibility. So it's like the the cause of rationality so it isn't necessarily rationality itself but it's <laughs> what makes a rationality possible i think it's both i think it is rationality itself as a, an ideal or a principle and in action is the rationality so it could be a little of both like the the greeks will have that the, the realms of the intelligible realm and the intellectual realm. And then there's like a mix of both in between. Um, but the, the intelligible realm, um, as far as I'm able to follow it, is it would be where we'd find logos. And then it would then cause all of those other things to actually be possible. Yeah, and that's not an inaccurate way to look at it in the, the way that it is meant here as uh, first principle. Because sometimes I wonder, like, can I look at the, the reconciling force as, as the logos uh, within the law of three? If it's rationality, I, I say no way it's, you know, that would be, yeah. that w wouldn't be the case as the principle of intelligibility. Maybe. Yeah, I would say that the Logos is actually more closely related to the denying force. Because rationality says, no, not that, this. And you're defining and giving shape. Yeah. Right? So in, in that model, then, like if uh, Logos would be the denying, what? what would be the reconciling? Uh, first, you have to find the affirming. Well, what would you say the affirming would be? I wouldn't. I would make you figure it out. <laughs> you already know enough to, to be able to figure that one out. Yeah, I, I think it just it really just goes back to how we're defining it. Like uh, to, to see logos as rationality, I could, I could definitely see that as a denying force. Um, as uh, the principle of intelligibility may be reconciling. So I guess I'll get back to you because I've been playing with this one for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. And remember, logos is also ratio. Yeah. And ratio is very clearly defined. <laughs> like, 
like you got Heraclitus who I think first used the word logos back in whatever, whatever BC. And Sixth century BC. Yeah. yeah. Five something. And so he, he'd say things like, like l- listen to um, the logos, not to my words. You know, mm-hmm. and, and, and like to say like, listen to my ratio or, or listen to the ratio, not to the words. It's harder to, harder to follow that as being the case, but l- l- like listen to the intelligibility, um, not to um, the words that has a, a more clear yeah. sense. Listen to the cause, not to the words. That has a, that has a fairly clear sense as well. It's like, and l- even listen to the ratio, uh, you can hear that in a way that makes perfect sense with what he's saying, uh, since the ratio is the perfect balance between two forces. It, it, it's so, I, I think it's like the, the fact that something can make sense is the logos at work. So like yes. just trying to make sense of it and, and the like meaning making, sense making, that all seems to be logos at work. Exactly right. And that is a perfect segue into the next verse. And I'm going to lay off the Greek and just go with uh, translation. So, we have, uh, let me find my notes here. The standard translation of verse 2 is, He was in the beginning with God. And going back to uh, Papyrus 66, if we look at the Greek, it comes out more like, This was in the beginning with God. So there was, there is no he in this exactly. Um, I have this all written out, so I have every single word with its proper definition. Takes a lot of time. It it took me two weeks. Um, So, this, to be, in, by, with, uh, arche, beginning, origin, uh, pros is uh, to be near, to, to, towards, to be, I like to be near, uh, ho, uh, th- uh, Theos. So, in the beginning, it was near the divine principle. It doesn't say it was the divine principle. It was a, it, to be near. And that's usually translated as, he was in the beginning with God. Then the the next line, uh, John 3, is all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being, and that has come into being. And... Everything through him has come, has come into existence, and without him came into existence nothing that has come into existence. And the him that they refer to is the Logos. Now, modern Christians were, are going to say, 
Oh, that that's talking about Jesus. And I suggest to you that conflating the dude Jesus with the idea of the Logos is a misinterpretation. Therefore, I am a heretic. I'll burn myself at the stake later. Yeah, but what they, are ta yeah, what they are talking about here is completely not personal. It's not some dude that's hanging out with God. You know, it's not two guys hanging out on a cloud, sipping tea, looking at all the things, and, and God going to the dude, hey, create everything for me. I'm tired. You do it. This is not what this means. When you realize that it is talking about logos in all of the depths of its meaning, it is saying that Everything that is created is created through this process and principle, through this principle of the rational, of reason, of logic, of uh, order, of all of these things. How are we doing so far? Have I lost everybody? Except for Chris, because I know Chris likes this stuff. Well, I mean, this certainly is challenging to uh, even my understanding as someone who grew up Christian and who was guided to read this as if it were talking about, you know, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Yeah, or as I like to think of it, the dude. The dude. Yeah. The dude, yeah. The nice guy, the dude. Um, but this is this is something that goes. It's a bit. It is certainly more esoteric in the sense that it's talking about raw stuff of creation. Yes, and it is contradicting. Uh, a lot of what passes for theology. Say a little bit about that. I mean, Jonathan, did you Yeah, Jonathan that? has something to say, and he's on a roll tonight, so let's listen to him. He probably knows more than I do tonight. Well, it brings me, when I think about this idea, it brings me a sense of comfort to think that this world that I'm living in and experiencing, which seems like it's very random and chaos and chaotic, that if it's actually all being conceived by one God, one creator, and it's all according to his divine wishes, and there's all it's all logical it was all it's all meant to be supposed to be then i don't have to worry <laughs> worry that things are all crazy and chaotic i just have to search for the the reason behind it and try and align myself with it yes and there, there is more to it than just that, but that's the start. I mean, because things, from the point of view of a human being sitting on planet Earth right now, when I look around, I say, things are pretty damn chaotic. You know, we're sitting on a planet of insane primates who are doing their damnedest to commit um, suicide as a species. And yet, that will fit into the way the Logos works. It is one of the rational outcomes that we can have. And here's part of the thing is that there is not just one choice. 
the way that this is set up, it seems to be, it, as in, implied with this, is that there are a number of paths that we can take that are involved with what choices we make. And we can see those paths if we have reason installed in our systems. If we do not have reason installed, we do not see the paths. I would even go so far as to say that, I mean, you're hinting at this, Mushtaq, that yes. the chaos that we experience is as much part of the logic and reason as everything else. Yeah. It is part of the plan. Yeah, and if it, it's one of those if-then things, as far as I can tell, if we choose to do this, we get this result. If we choose to do that, we get that result. If we choose to do this as a species, the species gets this result. And as much as we like to think that we are special, the cockroaches are waiting in the wings to take over being the intelligent life on this planet. So, let me check in before I go any further on this. And see how y'all are doing. Zainab, what do you think? Um, in the movie Matrix, the, the white guy, would you say he's the, the mathematician? He's the Logos? Um, I, which white guy are you referring to? Are you talking about Neo, the main character? No, no, in the in the white room. I don't remember his. Oh, in the white room. Oh, yeah. the 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 oh. ar architect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So the architect character that old. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. He was kind of evil, though. Yeah, he was. Yeah, so um, I don't perceive the Logos as being evil. He might be the evil shadow of the Logos, which we, dis we discover in the next line. The Pathologos. Yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, let's call on people. Um, David, what do you think? What's coming up for you? Any questions you have so far? Uh, no questions, just trying to hang in there, honestly. Yeah, this is deep stuff. This is not going to be one of those uh, videos that gets a thousand likes and everybody's all commenting on it. Uh, but this is more for you guys than the public. Cherie, what do you think? Uh, I don't think I can really comment because it's just this. This is such a confusing topic, but I did like that last explanation about um, just the wholeness of ratio and logic. Is it's just really kind of um, mind bending for me because, like, nor I grew up in a Christian basis, and to let that go, that's really um, bending <laughs> it's stretching yeah. yeah and it, and it's like okay to think of it quite differently and to ask an intelligent question it's just like almost beyond my capacity yeah. but you know that's yeah. hanging in there as you say and i think hmm okay all right it's uh, it's almost like the divine is so great that i can't describe it yeah but here's something to think about. In your, in your prior religion, from what you've described to me, there was no reason in it at all. There was zero logic. There was no rationality. 
Mm. Uh, it was operating on something other than Logos. Mm. So the the idea that this logic is whole and complete and as Jonathan said, like you can just surrender to that and actually what we don't understand, the chaos and everything that's happening us around, there is a logic we don't understand, but the logic is there. Is that what you're saying? Um, no, not exactly, because I think that we need to open ourselves to understanding. Mm -hmm. Through the principles of the Logos, we can begin to discern the patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we are given uh, ideas that do not match the patterns, that do not fit the rules of the Logos, uh, it, for me, it's an experience of cognitive dissonance. Mm. Uh, so when I, uh, I used to drive by this sign every day when I lived in Washington, uh, and it said, believe on the Lord and you shall have eternal life. And I looked at that and I went, this does not parse. This is <laughs> not, there is... There is an, an irrationality to this that uh, strikes me as false. Mm -hmm. That recognizing of patterns is something that is just starting to come into my awareness about recognizing those patterns. And I love patterns and I, I used to love mathematics and all those kinds of things. So hearing all this, I'm just thinking, hmm, you know, this is something I need to be open to. This is something yeah. that's intriguing to me. And I don't have enough behind me to understand exactly what you're saying. There is a confusion there, for sure. That's okay. Confusion ain't a bad thing. Uh, and the thing is, Without the Logos, see, human beings are designed to see patterns. Mm. We need to see patterns. Mm. Uh, being able to see patterns has kept us alive as a species. But we have the ability to see patterns whether they're there or not. This is how you get the crazy QAnon people, right? They mm -hmm. see these disparate events and they draw patterns between them. And because they have not the logos in their hearts, they do not have the discernment to see that uh, their patterns fail the test of the logos. Mm. Fail, I love that, the, the sound of that, failing the test of the logos. So how do we apply that? Uh, we learn to uh, perceive the world through rational eyes, which is not easy because uh, our irrational brain is very, very strong. When it comes to reason and emotion, emotion almost always wins. Mm -hmm. So you get a, a crowd of people <coughs> and you tell them, those people over there are terrible, cannibalistic, baby-killing uh, politicians. And they have hidden all of these captive babies in the basement of this pizza parlor. And you keep telling them that and getting them to believe it and working up emotion around it. Mm -hmm. uh, to the point where nobody questions. And what you get is some dude coming into this pizza parlor with a rifle to free the babies and discovering that the pizza parlor doesn't have a basement. Because that poor schmuck who is sitting in prison right now did not have access to the Logos, did not know how to use the Logos to test for the truth. Mm. And so we have to learn to do that. This is part of the secret of this. And the last line of this tells us the secret or last two lines uh, 
in him, life was. In the Logos, life was. And the life was the light of humankind. And the light in the darkness shines, and the darkness it not subdues. That's a weird way to read this. Nor you did some work on on some of these uh, verbs here. Uh, I did some work on the last verb in okay. this section. This word subdues. I worked on that one, so I don't know if we want to jump right to that. Um. Well, let's take a quick quick look at 4, verse yeah, 4, which is, In him that. was life, and the life was the light of humanity, humankind. Um, and it's interesting because um, it's en otos. In, en otos can be him. It could also be her. In himself, in herself, in themselves, in itself. He, she, it. Um, so it is neutral. And we make it masculine, but uh, it can be, it is not just masculine. It's masculine, I mean, the noun is uh, singular masculine, but it means all of these things. Uh, it's an inclusive masculine. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And yeah, there is a thing. Inclusive masculine nouns. <laughs> yep. And zoe means uh, one who possesses, is in possession of vitality or has the animating principle within them. Um, it can mean the absolute fullness of life. Uh, to be, to be present uh, yeah, it, it basically, this concept of the divine vitality, the, the animating force, uh, the Ruh Al-Quds. Uh, the Holy Spirit. Yes. Uh, or the divine breath. Uh, is in this Logos. Um, so yeah, we talked about this being the principle through which things come into being, the thing that brings things into being in a certain sense. And there is this vivacity to it. Yep. So the idea of light here, uh, foche, uh, it means light, uh, it means the emanations of light, uh, and it also is the divine aura. And it, it has the sense of this animating force is as if your body were lit from inside. And that comes from this Logos. So, the people who are in touch with Logos have a light within them. That's kind of heavy. And Chris notes that maybe this is why Jesus used parables. And that's kind of what he said. He said, to the masses I speak in parables, but to you I speak directly, when he was talking to his apostles. Not that you guys are apostles or anything. Sorry, Ilmar. I hope he's doing okay. Anyway, where were we? Talking about being lit from within with this uh, 
this kind of life force in a sense. Yep. And then we get to line five. And this is, this is the key to the key to all of this. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it is one way that this is translated. Nor do you, do you care to take a look at that? Uh... Yeah, so this, this term overcome, the original Greek has, I mean, it's been translated in multiple ways. It can be overcome, it can be comprehended, apprehended, grasped, extinguished, uh, understood. So these are all terms that kind of come into play with the describing of this relationship between the light and the darkness. And the light in the darkness shines. In the darkness, it not subdues. It not overcomes. It doesn't comprehend, it doesn't apprehend, it doesn't grasp, it doesn't extinguish, it doesn't understand. So the original Greek literally means acquire, grasp, lay hold of, and then it has this preposition added to it that adds an intensity to this term. So it's like an intense acquiring a strong grasping and it can mean apprehend to apprehend so you lay hold of as to make one's own to attain attain to to seize upon to detect to catch to lay hold of with the mind, to understand, perceive, to learn, to comprehend. So the darkness is unsuccessful in doing any of those things. That is how I have understood it thus far. And that is a pretty damn good understanding as far as I understand it. Yeah. So this Logos which is, you know, this light that shines in the darkness is unable to be apprehended or understood or seized upon, obtained by the darkness. It just abides. Yes. The Logos may be apprehended only through the Logos. So again, if we tie it back to how we're understanding Logos, which is this rationality as a principle and in action, which things come into being. Yep. So when we say that, we define this darkness. What do you think we're talking about there? Is it a lack of connection with logos? Darkness is the place where the light doesn't shine. So it would be, yeah, it's, it's the uh, irrational faculties. It is the, the chaos of the uh, uncomprehending. So, the secret of this is that these five lines tell you what you need to do in order to move yourself from your own darkness into your own light. And that is to cultivate the rational factor, uh, to, co to, to cultivate 
reason and logic, not in the book learning sense, but in the sense of knowing how to perceive what is true. And there, there are rules to that. So I'm not saying go take a course in logic at your local community college, though that might not be a bad thing to do. You know, starting with Aristotle is, is not the worst thing you can do. But realizing that you have to be able to apply these, uh, the rules of the logos to your experience to be able to see where the light is is the whole secret of this. And like I said, this, this, this five verses is very Pythagorean. You know, Pythagoras would say, all right, learn some math, dude. So I have a, I mean, it's not, I don't know if it's a question because I feel like I intuitively understand this, but I mean, we're not talking about just raw, unfeeling, disembodied, mental gymnastics type rationalization. No. 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 no, because in order to use the logos correctly, you have to have all of your centers working. And by centers, we mean you have to have your moving center you have to be in your body you have to have your emotional center working then you have to have your intellectual center working and you have to have your higher centers at least beginning to work yeah 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 because i think when people hear you know rationality and all that stuff they're they're just thinking of like raw mentalism they're thinking of mr spock Usually. Yeah, and and that's unfortunate and, because we yeah because Mr. Mr. Spock, Spock was never logic <laughs> yeah Mr. Right. Spock was never logical he was just dissociated yeah and we should not mistake dissociation for the kind of embodied wisdom and knowing supported by reasoning that we're talking yes. about here. Yeah, and you have to, but you have to have the reason as a, a mitigating factor. Otherwise you have runaway emotion. Right, like that is, that is an, it, unequivocally a key part to this is being able to embrace reason. I see you unmuted. Sure. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Apart from you two, what other human groups could we recognize as operating this way without understanding all of the uh, intellectual part that we're talking about today? How, are there human groups that actually operate with all their centers and have a balanced life and I think so. Who are they? Um, well, your neighbors to the south are kind of working on it. New Zealand? It, yeah, New Zealand seems to be attempting to be a, 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 a logos-driven country. But And you'll notice that at least in the presence of... Uh, in the avatar of Jacinda, she has a huge heart and yet operates from a very rational place. So there's a little bit of that there. You find uh, a lot of that in Iceland. I think it's just too cold to be overcome by emotion in Iceland or something. But as a, as a group, they have made some powerfully uh, reasoned choices and have not fallen prey to the emotionality that is used to control the species. Like, for instance, during the great economic crash where everybody was going, the banks are too big to fail. They went, screw that. 
arrested all of the bankers and refused to be responsible for the loans that those bankers made because they did not make them. The people? Yeah, the people. The country did not make the the they the kid the the people did not acquire the debt. The banks acquired the debt through their own malfeasance. And what the international monetary people wanted is for the country to assume the debt that the banks acquired. For the everyday people to take yeah, on that burden. Even though those everyday benefit. people had no benefit from that. Right. Yeah. And I like the way Iceland handled that. Throw them assholes in jail and tell the International Monetary Fund to go screw itself. And I have to say, they survived that better than we did. So it often means hard choices because yeah. it is not normal for us to live in tune with logos at least you know as it stands societally that is not the uh for most of us not our reality yeah and this is definitely not to say that Nora and i have perfected this i will tell you for sure that under certain circumstances, for instance, if Nora gets really sick and I'm worried that she's going to die, the whole rationality thing can go right out the window. I mean, I certainly felt that way when they were coming at me with an IV. Like, it was just, yeah. don't care. I know, I mean, obviously, Logos went out in the sense that I submitted to the situation and let it happen. And yeah. yet, there was an emotionality there that made it way harder Yeah, and uh, trust me when I tell you that I have seen many people fail at that. Um, you know, when I was working in the hospitals, I would occasionally get a call from the ER saying, we need a couple of people from the psych unit down here to help us. Because somebody was that freaked out. I was almost there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you did good. You did yeah. good. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yep. Breath practice, y'all. Yep. <laughs> I see sure you laughing. <laughs> well, I had to laugh because I, I had an anaphylactic episode where I was rushed to the emergency and, and they're trying to put a cannula into my arm. And I just kept watching it. What are you doing? What are you doing? And my heart rate was exploding. But it was just like the all emotion just takes all of your wisdom and your intelligence away with you. But I just I was just fascinated at what they were doing. But uh, yeah, I can understand your your uh, your reaction to seeing an IV coming at you. And if it's a big gauge thing, you just go, what? That's just, not it was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the nurse that put the IV in her was the absolute sweetest, most calm human being you would ever want working on you. And she did everything right. She did. Every single thing. I, I, and it was still you know, terrifying for Nora. <laughs> not personal at all whatsoever. It's really just a me thing. And I explained that to her and she was able to support me through that, which was amazing. And it allowed me to regain my sense of being with what is yeah i think this is a, an, a powerful comment you know that you you've made it that emotion when that gets out of hand and actually recognizing that when a loved one is in a dire state and you can't do anything about it and you feel so helpless and all of that that's when we have to really marshal in our awareness and like hang on to it you know don't, don't lose your lolly don't lose your shit you really got to have that wired tight that's where i can actually recognize what this lesson here what you're trying to tell us that understanding having a taste of light 
you know, we, we kind of, we recognize it in some people, we recognize moments in our lives when we've stepped up and been able to do that and then how to hang on to that because time and time again, we're going to get faced with more drama, more emotion, more and more emotion. And as we're getting older, I said to my mum, I'm now at that age where I'm going to go to more funerals than weddings. And she looked at me and I said, this is the truth. And so being able to have that heart in the midst of an emotional wave that can sweep you away, that is where I can recognize where I'm trying to keep with that uh, logic and, and stay whole. Yeah. Frack <laughs> ourselves off into. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's good that we're talking about some practical stuff in which this comes into play because I think that helps bolster better understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, and I can tell you that more than once I have had to literally sit on somebody who was freaking out because there was a loved one being worked on in the ER and they had they felt completely helpless and they were out of control they did not know how to to bring it back and so I'm just sitting there going don't worry man it's going to be okay and I'm just going to sit on you till you get a hold of yourself again so <laughs> it's all good it takes. yeah yeah I almost makes me think of like those thunder shirts you can put on a dog when you're freaking out because they just need to feel that sense of security and like, yeah. <laughs> okay, back into my body, I'm here, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, uh, it's part of the message is, I will, I will control you until you can control yourself and then it will be fine. With compassion, of course, you know, rather With, than... Yeah, that. you have to, you have to be calm and compassionate yourself. If you get angry, it just escalates everything. Yeah. So it's not it's not about like dominating in that sense, yeah. Oh, it's actually about dominating. Well, it's totally it, about dominating. <laughs> physically, psychologically, you have to psychologically dominate a person like that because they have lost their limits. Borrowing their autonomy for a while. Yeah, so <laughs> you you basically have to say, "I will give you your limits until you find them again." Mm. It's okay. Yeah. Things that they don't show you on the, the hospital shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, it sounds like Logos is just like being in touch with your autonomy, with your means of, as, as Chris said, sense making. Yeah. The organizing rational principle that you have within you. I don't always love how that term gets used these days, but I feel like it's a good term right now. Yeah. Sense making, that is. Yeah. yeah. So that's basically what we got for you tonight. You guys did so good. Yeah. You didn't throw up your hands in despair, which is kind of what I was worried about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a lot. It's heavy stuff. Um, but, you know, it's it's actually fairly easy to pull up this stuff online and then go through, you know, it's boring Bible stuff sometimes, but it gives you a taste of how much deeper these manuscripts go than what we end up being exposed to you know, on a Sunday at church. Yeah, because we are stuck with accepted interpretation. Yeah, and as you can see, like, I, I gave you, like, 10 different plug-in synonyms for one, you know, one verb in this thing. And you have to realize that that's true for almost every verb in there. And yep. for many nouns as well. So all of those meanings get lost when we're trying to synopsize into a translation that many different parties can be 
comfortable with, let's say. But yeah, this is this is such a great little snippet of how rich this stuff really is. And how much is hidden in plain sight? We people read this passage a thousand times a day, a million times a day, and they miss it all. Right, and we're numb to it. I mean, for people who have, like, I, 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 I grew up in Christianity. I have given my commitment elsewhere at this point. And when I read these things, I, I feel a numbness to them because it's just like, oh, this again. But there is something there that we can all connect with if we give it the chance. Any last questions or thoughts? Well, one last thought. Sure. You know, when you started talking, you or Mushtaq started talking about how the fundamental thing is the rationality, I realized how much I'd gotten involved in irrational metaphysics. I mean, like Taoism, yeah. the, the universe kind of goes rolling on in an incomprehensible way. And yeah, I'm not sure I would classify Taoism as irrational, though. Unrational? It has a, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure that I could see it as irrational. I see that it has a very powerful self-consistency and uh, a serious set of rules to think by. Mm -hmm. They're just different than what we're used to in the West. And interpreted differently, depending yeah. on who you're, what resource you're turning to, I would imagine. <laughs> but yeah, I, I also would, I feel the same as Mishtak in that I feel like as a rationality to it that is worthy of some exploration. But I, I still wanna, I wanna understand more about your thought process, Nancy. Say more about that. Um, well, there's, I, I don't know, you know, maybe irrational is putting it too strongly, but there's the idea of the universe is too much to be comprehended by the human mind. I think. Yeah, there, there is definitely that, but I don't mm -hmm. see that as being irrational. Well, no, it, it, it is true, but if it's different than putting your primary emphasis on rationality. Um, And I mean, it, it, I'm think I'm thinking about it now. Um, you know how much I've picked up the kind of stuff where the strong emotion is the most important thing, um, which is not necessarily a good idea. I mean, I think it's good to be reminded that there can be the um, you know, to the extent that things can make sense, you should have them make sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think there's something to, to this idea of rationality and kind of a dismissal of the way in which things play out in rational ways and sometimes we just aren't really attuned to that so we just are like I, I can't be bothered with that it's all bullshit and it's I don't get it doesn't make sense to me I don't care mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> or just you know the this whole like following our ungrounded emotional 
leaps and bounds from thing to thing and issue to issue and moment to moment. Mm -hmm. There is quite a bit of uh, a tendency towards that, which we are challenging. Yeah. Thanks, Nancy. Did you have um, anything else you wanted to share or? Um, well, the uh, fantasy novel with the uh, syllogisms was the Inconclusion Shanner by L. Sprague de Camp. Yes. Was <laughs> awesome. Thanks. And they were a fun bunch of stories. Yeah, I don't know that they were metaphysically all that deep, really. <laughs> no, they they were for a lark, but you know, they were fun, and I think I was like sixteen or seventeen when I read them, oh, wow. and made me think. Okay, let's learn about syllogisms. Maybe I can I can translate to another dimension. Never worked so far. I think though. Maybe this is the other dimension. Oh, no. <laughs> Whoops. All right. Aaron, how are you doing? And Zainab, how are you doing? I have no question. We should do more of these talks, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. David, how about you? Um. Doing a bit better, but still a lot confused. But I have the same thing with the Catholic Christianity background and being like, oh man, no. Yeah, it, it is kind of like having to dismantle a little bit of programming around this. It's, I mean, I think I'm, I am far enough out from my Christian upbringing that it's less challenging, but there is a sense of like, whoa, how can we not talk about Jesus in the midst of all this? But I I get why we're taking this in the direction that we're taking it. Yeah. So David, if you had to say what might be the most challenging part of this for you? I mean, like in terms of acting with it. Um wrapping my head around the logos and how it's with God, but not uh, the same thing. Yeah, that's a tricky part. Yes, we can kind of think of it. I mean, here's one way that I'm thinking about it that I'm finding it useful. It's kind of like that it's pouring forth from God. I don't know if that's another useful metaphor or image, but I think that kind of gets at it being of God, from God, within God, and also God. I don't know. This is something we may have to chew on for a while. Yeah. I wish I had all the answers, but not so far. Jonathan, how about you? Nothing more to add. All right, cool. Chris, how about you? Um, I'm going to put into the chat a thing I did um, some time ago. So like a number of y'all here, I grew up um, reading the Bible. And I put together some time ago a bunch of different examples in the New Testament where the word um, word is used. And the Greek, it's almost every time it's actually logos. So there's some really interesting examples when you look at the New Testament. And um, I'm going to put 
a link to that in here. So any of you who want to take a look at this, you can start to see how the 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 writers of the various uh, books and letters in the Bible are using um, logos in this case. Cool. How would you feel about sharing that in the forum as well? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Awesome. All right. So I encourage you to put that up after we finish up. All right. So I think we should wrap it up. I think so too, because I don't know about you, but I'm getting hungry. I am hungry too. <laughs> I feel like we put the work in. We earned it now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go. All right, Rady folks. Bunch mode. We are mode. in Rady Bunch mode. And we can wave goodbye. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for hanging in there and enjoying this brain puzzle. We'll keep on, you know, chewing on this. And I think it'll be fun to check out the thing that Chris is going to post in the forum. Showing all of those instances of the word logos. Yeah. Or, you I know, just word. took a glance at it just now, and it actually yeah. looks pretty darn good. Don't let it go to your head, but it looks really good. So I hope you all check that out and have some fun with it. Uh, yeah. And we will see you next week. Take care, everybody. Bye. <laughs>